This is a sticker that was placed in the front of the Cobb County, Georgia biology textbooks back in 2002. This textbook contains material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origin of living things. This material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. Seems like a pretty good mode of operation. Look at things with an open mind, study them carefully, critically consider them. In fact, if you were to say, where would a person get an idea that that is the way things should be approached? You know, if you were to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, you would hear the Apostle Paul state, test all things, hold on to what is good. The idea that you should just blindly follow something that somebody tells you, bad idea. You need to look at it. You need to look at it with an open mind. You need to study it carefully. You need to critically consider it. And yet this sticker didn't stay in the biology textbooks. In fact, I was speaking at Cobb County, Georgia, not long after this sticker was placed in the textbooks. And this sticker was rejected even after it suggested you should look at this with an open mind, study it carefully, critically consider. It was rejected because they said that it was unconstitutional. Okay, now what aspect of this particular sticker is unconstitutional? Here's what they said, it's too religious. That this sticker represents too much religion and the separation of church and state says that that cannot be the case. You can't put that in a public school textbook. Now, they're wrong, number one, about the separation of church and state. It never has been that publicly or governmentally you can't say anything about God or even teach about God in the Bible. That's never been the case from the beginning. And so they're wrong about that to start out with. But the second part of this is, let's read the statement again. This book contains material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origin of living things. This material should be looked at with an open mind, study carefully, critically considered. What's it say about Jesus? What's it say about God? Anything about the Bible? Anything about any religion whatsoever? No. Now, why in the world would people not want you to look at evolution with an open mind? mind and study it carefully and critically consider it. Well, I, I think that any person who was approaching this from the outside asking the question, what are you afraid of, would quickly realize that the only reason you would reject anything like that, because if someone said to me, Kyle, if you have young people in your audiences or in your classes, etc., how would you like them to approach Christianity? You know what I would say? about Christianity. I would say I'd like young people to approach Christianity with an open mind. I'd love them to study it carefully and to critically consider it, meaning don't just take what I say for it, you check it out for yourself. So anytime a system says, hold on just a second, wait, we don't want you to look at this with an open mind. We don't want you to study it carefully. We don't want you to critically consider it. Then I think you should ask yourself why that would be the case. Now, what we're going to do this evening is compare the idea of creation with the idea of evolution. Evolution was put forth in its formalized version by a man named Charles Darwin in 18, the 1850s. And he wrote a book titled On the Origin of Species by Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races. And that book immediately sold out. It was immediately translated into multiple different languages. And the atheistic community said that Darwin allowed atheists to be intellectually, well, he said, it gave people a way to reject God when looking at the natural world. And so this idea of evolution is the idea that in the beginning there were, were no animals, no life, no living organisms. And then somehow the first living organism popped into existence from chemical processes that are not being seen today. And that first single cell organism, single cell bacteria, somehow gave rise to, to a multi-celled organism, and that multi-celled organism somehow gave rise to a worm, and then a worm, to a fish, and then a fish, to a lizard, and a lizard, to a mammal, a mammal to a lower mammal, like a, 
like a lemur, lower monkey, and then ultimately a monkey-type creature giving rise to humans. That's the idea of evolution. Now, creation is very different than that. Creation, creation says there's an intelligent designer who, if you look at the creation story in the Bible, spoke the world into existence. And things came in fully formed. They did not gradually evolve from lower life forms. They were put here by an intelligent creator who did not bring them into existence by a long process. Now, as you look at that, the evolutionary idea says there's no intending mind. Everything that happens is an accident. Those accidents somehow just get preserved and they get passed on somehow, but there's nothing that's directing the process. And so here's what we're going to do this evening. We're just going to look at the idea of blind chance random processes causing life and everything we see on this planet that's living. Is that a scientific idea or an intelligent creator who brought life into existence and ultimately caused that life to multiply after its own kind? So let's begin our discussion starting with one of the most fundamental laws of science that you will see. As Richard Dawkins, who is probably now the world's most famous atheist, approaches this idea of creation versus evolution, he says, well, it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, well, that person's ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Now, I dare say many of you in here this evening don't believe in evolution, so which of these are you? You just don't know any better? You're ignorant? Maybe you're stupid. You don't have the ability to comprehend it. Maybe you're off your rocker. Or maybe you're just intentionally wicked and trying to mess things up. You know, it's interesting to me that if he were to apply that to people like Sir Isaac Newton, if he were to apply that to Warner Von Braun, if he were to apply that to any number of scientists who have done amazing things in the past and at the present, Raymond Domitian, who is the inventor of the MRI machine, a very staunch creationist, I would wonder what he would say about those people. Now, what do you think is happening when someone says, hey, if you don't believe what I believe, you're stupid? What is that? Well, it's intellectual bullying, really. And that's exactly what we should expect. If you look at that sticker and it says, hey, look at this with an open mind, consider it critically, and study it carefully, and they say, no, you can't do that. In fact... You just need to take what we tell you and not ask any questions. And if you ask any questions, it's because you're insane, stupid, wicked, or you just don't know any better. Well, let's start with this simple law of biogenesis. Now, you guys know what the law of biogenesis is. We've been knowing this probably from the time you were just a little kid. Here's what the law of biogenesis says. It's real simple. It says all life in the material universe comes from previously existing life of its own kind. Now, let me state that this is what we know scientifically. And here's what I mean. A law is something that there's never been an exception to in the history of all science study. Never. If you ever found an exception to this, guess what? This would not be anymore. Would not be a law if there was ever an exception. It's very easy to understand. The law of biogenesis says every time you see life in this material universe, it came from previously existing life of its own kind. Now, Here's why that is profound. Because in the past, people didn't believe that. In fact, in the past, they said, hey, we know life can pop into existence from non-living chemicals, and we've got proof of that. Oh, do you? Well, could you give that to us? Yes, just take a T-bone steak, pop it on your kitchen counter, and come back two weeks later in the middle of the summer with your window open. And guess what you'll have? Maggots. They spontaneously generate on your steak. It's a spontaneous process from the chemicals in your steak and the air that comes through that window. You didn't see any maggots crawl onto it. You didn't see any maggots fall out of the sky. And yet we have maggots on there. Boom. Maggots spontaneously generated on your steak. They said, that's not enough for you. Take some old sweaty rags, wrap some wheat inside of them and put them in the corner of your barn and come back in a month. Do you know what the chemical process of old sweaty rags and wheat cause to generate if you leave it there for a month preferably while it's warm 
mice. It spontaneously generates mice. You didn't see them come in there. They just somehow spontaneously generated from the chemical properties. Now, as we're looking at that, we're thinking, guys, no, that, that's not right at all. You're crazy. In fact, in the 1600s, about 1660, a guy by the name of Francisco Reed, he said, guys, I'm just not buying this spontaneous generation stuff. I, I think that something else is going on, at least with these maggots. And so he did this really ridiculously simple experiment. And you'll read it in every biology textbook you ever pick up. Over here, he put a bunch of jars with meat in them, left them unsealed. They're open. Over here, he put a bunch of jars with meat in them, hermetically airtight sealed them with something like saran wrap. Waited. Flies landed on the meat that was unsealed, maggots formed, flies tried to get in the meat that was sealed, nothing happened, no maggots. He said, you know what, guys? I believe I've just made it an unbelievable breakthrough. I think flies are producing maggots. And they said, no, that's crazy. Maggots spontaneously generate. Your problem is you didn't let air get in the meat. And you got to have the chemical properties of the air, and that is what causes the maggots to form. He said, okay. I see what we can do. All right, so meat over here in jars unsealed, meat over here in jars that were sealed. In the middle, he put meat in jars that had a netting substance like gauze, medical gauze, where air could come in, but the flies couldn't. Flies formed on the unsealed meat jars. Flies did not form on the sealed meat jars. On the gauze-type netting material, maggots formed and... They didn't form on the meat, they formed on the gauze. He said, I think what we just learned is that maggots come from flies. They said, wow, I think you're right. So are you saying spontaneous generation doesn't occur? He said, no, 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 I'm just saying maggots don't spontaneously generate. I think other stuff could, just not maggots. Now, that's what they thought until 18, oh, right at about 1868. By 1868, we had microscopic abilities that we could look at stuff and see little tiny tiny things that you couldn't see with the unaided eye we had invented the microscope and so a guy by the name of louis pasteur took that microscope and he zoomed in on meat broth and you let meat broth sit out for a little while i mean take a chicken noodle soup bowl and put it on your kitchen counter and come back in a week who wants to eat it if it's not refrigerated well why don't you eat a bowl of chicken noodle soup that's been sitting out on your counter after a week well, you zoom in a microscope on it and you'll quickly see why you don't want to eat that because there will be billions of bacteria and things swimming around in your soup that you don't want to ingest. So he zoomed in on meat broth and he said, all right, guys, these things have to spontaneously generate. That's what they said to Pasteur. Pasteur said, no, that's, that's not true. And so Pasteur took meat broth put it in a flask, he did this a bunch of times, several, and put a special S-shaped curve on the flask so that the air could go into the meat broth, but the gravity would stop any microscopic organisms. So in 1868, Louis Pasteur once and for all deals the death blow to spontaneous generation. He says, guys, here's what we have learned. Life in the material universe only comes from previously existing life of its own kind. What they saw when he boiled the meat broth, no microscopic organisms formed because they don't spontaneously generate between air and stuff. And then when he would break the neck off of those specially formulated flasks, air would go straight back down along with the microscopic organisms. Boom, you got a bunch of tiny little swimming stuff in there now. Since 1868, here's what every single biology textbook tells you. Every one. According to this story, evolution, every tree, every blade of grass, and every creature in the sea and on land evolved out of one parent strand of molecule matter, matter drifting lazily in a warm pool. What concrete evidence supports this remarkable theory of the origin of life? There is none. Now, that's from a guy named Robert Jastro, who was not a creationist. This is from a... An individual known as George Wald, here's what he says. One has only to com contemplate the magnitude of this task to conceive that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. So it can't be done. Yet here we are, as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. 
He says, you can't get life to spontaneously generate, but we're here. Okay, what's his problem? Spontaneous generation is impossible, but I don't want to believe in a God. And so if I don't want to believe in God, I have to take spontaneous generation as having occurred sometime in the past. And I know it's impossible, but I'm here and I don't want to say God did it. So I have to say, I just believe in the impossible. Continue with me. Notice this next slide. George Gaylord Simpson, there is no serious doubt that biogenesis is the rule, that life comes only from other life, that the cell, the unit of life is always and exclusively the product or offspring of another cell. Now, guys, George Gaylord Simpson was one of the most well-known, most credentialed atheistic evolutionists of his time. And here's what he says, here's what we know. Hey, in this physical world, life comes from previously existing life of its own kind. Life does not spontaneously generate from non-living chemicals. Now, according to the atheistic evolutionary idea, where did life have to come from? It had to spontaneously generate from non-living chemicals. And yet it doesn't do that. You know what's so ironic about that particular situation is you can take a frog and put it in a, take a dead frog. You could, this is fairly disgusting thought, but work with me and put it in a blender. And you've got every single cell you need for life. You don't even have to build any of the proteins. You don't even have to build any of the DNA. It's all there. But you can't get it to live. And yet somehow we're told, according to this atheistic evolutionary idea, that you didn't have any of the proteins, you didn't have any of the cells that you needed, you didn't have any of the DNA, and it spontaneously generated from non-living chemicals, and yet in every single biological experiment ever done, listen to me, in every single biological experiment ever done in the history of the world, life in the material universe comes from previously existing life of its own kind. The first problem with that atheistic evolutionary idea is you can't even get it off the ground. You can't even get life to pop into existence. Now here's your next problem. The second half of the law of biogenesis. That life comes from previously existing life of its own kind. Now see, here's what we're told. The first single-celled amoeba evolved from non-living chemicals and then ultimately it changed into multicell bacteria and that bacteria to worms, etc. Here's what you and I both know. If you've ever been around any type of animal or creature, you know that... Well, let me explain this to you. Years ago when we were coming from East Tennessee, we had a dog that... Well, we had lived in East Tennessee for about five years. The dog wandered up to our house, as I recall, one day and we named the dog Max thinking that Max was a male. Max was not a male. Max soon was going to have puppies, and we realized, okay, we're going to have to lengthen her name to Maxine and then call her Max for short, and so we did. But we were bringing her from East Tennessee to Middle Tennessee with us, and it was time for her to have baby. And it was very, very close to time, and so I remember... Now, this is in my mind as a very small kid, so work with me. I remember... We stopped at a hotel and we brought Max into the hotel room and put her in the bathtub. And that night, Max did have babies. And I got up the next morning and I looked in that bathtub and there were eight of the cutest baby hippopotamuses. There were pygmies that you have ever seen in your life. Max gave birth to baby hippopotamuses. We sold them. That's what allowed me to go to Freed Hardeman University. And it is exciting to see a, a dog give birth to Okay, here's what you know. No, Max did not give birth to eight baby hippos. Oh, you're right. Okay, okay. All right. That, that doesn't happen, does it? Here's what really happened. Got up the next morning. Max gave birth to eight of the most beautiful half dog, half bird you have ever seen. We called them bogs. They were the cutest thing. Half of them had feathers. Half of them had fur. But you don't buy that either. Okay, here's what you know for a fact. You know it for a fact. When my dog had babies... What did my dog give birth to? Puppies. Every time. When your cat has babies, what does your cat have? Kittens. Your horse has babies. What does your horse have? The horse kind. When your cow has babies, what does the cow 
give birth to the cow kind every time now are there some dna options that occur when your dog has puppies can you have a black dog that gives birth to a yellow baby can you have a big dog that gives birth to a little dog can you systematically breed from something like a dingo and if you pick the biggest baby that that couple of dogs has and then you breed that dog back to the biggest one and you breed it back, back to the biggest one and you breed it back to the biggest one can you get something like a tibetan mastiff that weighs 250 pounds that looks like a lion yeah you could get a tibetan mastiff could you then take those two dogs that were like a dingo and breed it and get the littlest one and breed those and get the littlest one of that and littlest one of that and then breed it to something like a hairless chihuahua yeah so you've got a 250 pound Tibetan Mastiff and you've got a hairless Chihuahua over here, but guess what? This hairless Chihuahua hadn't gained genetic information, it's lost genetic information. It can never get back to your dingo type and this Mastiff over here hadn't gained genetic information, it's lost genetic information and it can't ever get back to your basic dingo type and you've got a, a Mastiff that weighs 250 pounds and a hairless Chihuahua that weighs five pounds and they all came from two parents that had the genetic information in them to give you that variety but guess what you can take that hairless chihuahua and you can try to breed it back to whatever you want to and you'll never get a horse out of it ever or a cat or a mouse or a rat you'll always have a dog kind because things multiply after their own Kind. You see, one of the basic problems with evolution is, number one, you can't get life from non-living chemicals. And number two, every single biological experiment ever done in the history of mankind shows you that life produces after its own kind. You see, according to evolution, you don't need to get it to change once. You don't need to get an amoeba to change into one kind of bacteria. You need to get it to change into millions of different now, here's what's exciting to me that you can see. They decided in about 1900 that the fruit fly was a great way to prove evolution because you could zap a fruit fly with radiation and stuff that would mutate its genome and you could get a new generation of fruit flies every 14 days. Oh, it was so exciting to them. And so they started zapping that fruit fly with radiation. They got fruit flies that would grow legs on top of their head. They got fruit flies that would grow no wings. Got fruit flies that would grow eight sets of wings. Got fruit flies that would grow wings on top of their head. Every 14 days they would do a new generation, they'd zap it with radiation. New generation, zap it with radiation. They've been zapping fruit flies for 100 years to the equivalent of what would be millions of years in nature of mutation on the fruit fly genome. Guess what you've got? messed up fruit flies it's all you've got they've never gotten it to have a beak they've never added any genetic information now here's what you've got from a single cell bacteria there are five million base pairs of information in the genetic code of a single bacteria five million base pairs in the human genome there are three billion which is 600 times more than in a single bacteria. Now, you need 600 times more genetic information that you have to build to get a human from a bacteria. Now, let me explain to you what that means. If you have a 100-page book and you have 600 more times information than a 100-page book, you now have a 60,000-page book. I've read a 100-page book before. I've never read a 60,000-page book. Now, just think if a hundred page is the blueprint of information for a bacteria that you have to have for a bacteria to operate right, and a 60,000 page book is the blueprint for a, a human genome. That's how much new information you need. And we've never ever seen anything that adds the first statement of new genetic information anywhere. And so that's why things multiply after their own kind. And where would you get that idea? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he goes down and on day three, he makes the flowers, grass, and trees. And he says, be fruitful and multiply after 
your own kind. Now, as you continue with this idea, century of sensational discoveries in the biological sciences has taught us that life arises only from life. Now, these guys aren't creationists. They're not the friend of creationists at all. I'm going to now go through some things that most of the time you'll see in any textbook that is teaching you evolution. And they'll say, hey, this is evidence that evolution occurs. And so they come to the English peppered mall. And in virtually all of the textbooks that are presenting evolution, you'll read this story that before the Industrial Revolution, you had English peppered moths that were two varieties, dark colored and light colored. And if you were a bird and you were flapping by a tree trunk and you looked up and saw these two English peppered moths, which one would you eat if you liked moths? You know, you would probably eat that dark color one. Why? Well, because you could see it. And then we're told after the Industrial Revolution, after 95% of the moth population was light colored and 5% was dark colored, well, the lichens died on the trees. And because the lichens died on the trees, then the birds could more readily see the light colored moths. And so the variation changed ratios so that now the dark colored was 95% of the makeup of the moth population and light colored was only 5%. And then they said right here that this is evolution in action. Okay, this is evolution in action. It's what we're told because the population of English peppered moths, the ratio changed from 95% light to 95% dark. Now let's see how this works. You've got a dog who gives birth to 10 puppies. Six of them are light colored, four of them are dark colored. The dog mom is walking across a frozen pond. Tragically, it's too thin and some of the puppies don't make it. In fact, five of the light colored puppies do not make it. Now the ratio of dark to light puppies is four dark to one light. What do you now have? Evolution in action. Well, we had the whole, the whole puppy population change from six to four to now it's four to one. Is that evolution in action? No, what do you need? You need new genetic information. Now let's think about this simply. What did you have the DNA to make before the Industrial Revolution? Two varieties of English peppered moth, what were they? Light and dark. What did you have the genetic information to make after the Industrial Revolution? Two varieties of moth, light and dark. Okay, so you didn't add any new genetic information, you didn't turn them into anything else, they're still English peppered moths, they're still even the light and dark color, yeah, you didn't change anything. Now, this looks good on paper, but I, you know, also let's look at that. You ever tried to take a picture of a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old for Easter after buying them a, a duck to have in the picture? You know, I'm not going to say that it's easy to do. You couldn't just buy one duck. You had to buy two at Tractor Supply. They wouldn't sell you just one because they thought you might just use it for a picture. And so you had to buy two ducks at Tractor Supply and you get your kids all lined up there on the porch and you give them a couple ducks. And the ducks are going crazy. They're all over the place. Kids are looking at the ducks. You know how hard it is to take pictures of three kids and two ducks? You ever tried to take a picture of English Pepper Mall? I mean, I, I personally haven't, but you know, isn't it amazing that they lined up perfectly for these pictures? Isn't that cool? I mean, you got them to line up on lichen-covered tree trunks, and then you got them to line up on non-lichen-covered trees, and then they, well, how convenient. Wasn't that so nice of these pepper moths that they landed right beside each other? Oh, guess what? English pepper moths don't land on tree trunks. They land on the underside of leaves, and this has very little, if anything, to do with whether or not a bird can see them. It was just made up. But notice, when called on the carpet about this English pepper moth idea, this is a guy, Bob Ritter, Canadian textbook writer, he knew they were fake. Well, you gotta look at the audience. I mean, how convoluted do you wanna make it for a first time learner? He said, yeah, we know it's wrong, but we don't wanna, we don't wanna confuse these poor kids. Oh, okay. Uh, the advantage of this example of natural selection is it's extremely visual. You can see it real well. Okay. Oh. It's not true, but you can see it real well. 
Okay, so I have a theory that when white cows eat green grass, they grow purple spots. I bring a bunch of white cows, I put them out in the side here, and I say, guys, after this lesson, you're going to see that they have grown purple spots. And so you're paying attention to me. You're not paying much attention to the cows. And I take you out afterward. And sure enough, every one of my white cows has purple spots on it. You think, wow, this is, this is interesting. Never seen it done. But one of you who know some cow stuff, go up to the cow and you're petting and looking at it. And then, boy, your forehead itches and you scratch your forehead. And somebody looks at you and starts laughing. And you say, what are you laughing at? They say, well, you got something on your head. Sure enough, you look down, you got purple something all over your head. You go back to that cow that you touched and it looks like someone has painted those purple spots on there and you come to me and you say, Kyle, they didn't grow those purple spots. You painted them on there. I say, I know. But the advantage of it is it's extremely visual. You can see it real good. But what? But, but it's fake. But it's just so visual. Now, notice this. We want to get across the idea of selective adaptation. Later on, they can look at the work more critically. Did you enroll when you went to college in the class that was Stuff We've Told You Proves Evolution But It Doesn't 101? What class is that? Where do they say, you know what, you learned this in high school in 98% of the textbooks that were teaching biology and it's wrong and it didn't prove evolution and now we're going to straighten that up for you. Guess what? There's no class like that. When is, oh and by the way, why aren't they looking at this more critically? Why aren't they asking the question, how did the pepper moss get on the tree trunks in the first place? Why aren't they asking the question, there's no new genetic information? Why aren't the kids asking the question? Well, because you can't look at this stuff with an open mind and study it carefully and critically consider. What do you got to do? They don't want you to think about this stuff. Continue with me. This guy by the name of Ernst Haeckel, he read on the origin of species in 1860, the year after it was put into English in 1859, 1860, translated into German, he read it. He said, wow, this is amazing. This, this is the groundbreaking, seminal idea of biology. I'm going to prove it. And he comes up with this law of embryology. Here's what he says. He says, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. means a lot to you guys, doesn't it? Didn't mean anything to me either. First time I read it. So what in the world is the law of embryology? The ontogeny of an organism, its growth from that first cell to when it is born, recapitulates, recaps, goes through its phylogeny, its evolutionary history. He said, look, you can zoom in on a human embryo, and if you catch it at the right time, you'll catch it in a worm stage. And then if you zoom in later and you catch it at the right time, you'll catch it in a lizard stage and you'll catch it in this. He said, it's going through its evolutionary history. And he said, hey, guess what? Here's how you can know that. Look, we all had gill slits to start out with. Now, this is a turtle and a chicken and a pig and a dog and a human. But we all started out with gill slits and we started out with gill slits because we came from fish. And he called this the law of embryology. Now, a law is something you never find an exception to. Now, people who study the embryos say, hold on just a second, Hegel, I've I've never, I I have looked at these embryos for a long time and they just don't look like that to me when I look at them. They look different than that. He said, oh yeah, I I, I did draw some from memory. Appreciate that. And he said, I I did, I did uh, draw some where I would draw the exact same embryo and label it three different things. I'd draw a chicken embryo, and I'd label a dog, a pig, and a chicken. And they said, so you, you just kind of made this stuff up? He said, yeah, but hey, it proves the point so well that we don't need to worry about how I got it, basically. Well, here's what we know for a fact. Natural history, in 2000, a man by the name of Stephen Jay Gould, who was, when he was alive, one of the most outspoken proponents of evolution, here's what he said. He said... Haeckel remains most famous today as the chief architect and propagandist for a famous argument that science disproved long ago. Now, you might be wondering, okay, why are we even dealing with this? If science disproved it long ago, why why would we bring it up on a Wednesday night in 2021? I mean, what's the deal here? Okay, well, here's what he says. We should therefore not be surprised that Haeckel's drawings entered 19th century textbooks. He said, you know what, this is 19th century. They messed up a lot of stuff back then. 
But we do, I think, have the right to be both astonished and ashamed by a century of mindless recycling that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not the majority, of modern textbooks. Hold on just a second. You think you should be surprised at 100 years of mindless recycling? Why? You told the kids they can't look at this stuff with an open mind. You told them they can't study it carefully or critically consider it. So what are you asking them to do? Oh, you're asking them to mindlessly recycle this stuff. And then you get mad when they do it because the public school textbook publishers have done it for the last hundred years. You see, the problem there is that this stuff, well, let me show you. All right, so this is back in 2010. I was up in Swartz Creek, Michigan. We had just gone over these two things, that everyone in the entire community of the atheistic evolutionary community, the English pepper moss and Hegel's embryos, knows they're not proof for evolution, everyone. Okay, in 2010, this girl says, it was a very good sermon, I found it very interesting. What I found even more interesting is that this week in my biology class, we learned about the theory of evolution. During this segment, we had to do worksheets on evolution. Two of the main things we did were on the peppered moths and similarity in embryos. Those were two things you proved false during your sermon. You taught us that these things were proven false, but still put in textbooks and taught in schools today. I was astonished and humored that these two false teachings showed up in my high school the week following your sermon. Now think about that. Let's say we hadn't been in Swartz Creek a week before this. She goes to her biology class. The proverb writer says the first person to plead his case seems right until somebody comes and answers him. The kids are told, don't think about this too much, just listen to us, we're right. They're told that these two things prove evolution. They take it in, they don't critically consider it, they don't look at it with an open mind, they don't study it carefully, they just say, oh, I guess evolution's right because the smart people say it is, and I love my teachers, he's very smart and intelligent and real fun to have in class, and so I guess this is right. You know how many kids we get to reach with the correct information about creation as it's opposed to evolution every year? 5,000, maybe with all the, the people we got speaking, 10,000, maybe. You know how many go to school every single day and never get to critically consider the stuff they're being told? Millions. And so, as you look at this, here you go. Sometimes I ask for a show of hands. Any of you guys recognize that? Horse evolution, right there it is. There it is for you in pictorial form. It's like somebody took a picture of it for you, I mean, like right here is your, your little bitty guy. His name is Eohippus, Hierocotherium, and he somehow evolves into Mesohippus and Myohippus and Merichippus and Pliohippus and modern-day Equus. Notice how the toes are gradually transforming. They're getting smaller. They're going into this single hoof. You look at that in the textbook, boy, that looks exactly like that organism is gradually transitioning into that organism. That's what it looks like in picture form. And yet, here's Herbert Nielsen in 1954. Now, the reason I'm putting this from 1954 is because we've known it since 1954. We, we knew it from the very beginning of writing it, actually, but nobody really said anything about it. The family tree of, horse, of the horse is beautiful and continuous only in the textbooks. The construction of the horse is a very artificial one. It's put together from non-equivalent parts. Cannot be a continuous transformation series. Hey, guys, that picture is not right. Horses weren't continuously evolving from one little Eohippus into modern day Equus. We put that picture up there to show you that they were, but they weren't. That was 1954. The uniform continuous transformation of Hierocotherium into Equus so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers never happened in nature. Hey guys, just by the way, we've been showing you that picture for the last 70 years. And it never really happened in nature. Okay, where did it happen? If it did not happen in nature, where does it happen? In the minds of the textbook writer. That's it. Now, why is this important? We could do this all night, really. But what does it matter? I mean, Kyle, evolution, it's not that big of a deal. Just cool out. It's, it's, it's not that different from creation. Oh, it's, it's very different. And here's the difference. 
If you think you evolved from a blob of primordial slime over multiplied millions of years, and you are the product of accidental chance processes, and there's no purpose behind your existence, how does that make you feel? You know, probably a better question would be, how does that make you behave? Now, I don't know if you remember a man by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, in the 1990s, was accused of some of the vilest crimes that you would ever consider. In fact, to describe them would literally probably make you physically sick, and we simply won't do that this evening. But he was convicted of murdering 17 young men or boys. I think he confessed to 19 murders. So he goes on an interview with Stone Phillips back in 1995. Don't know if any of you remember Stone Phillips. He was one of the guys that was on the cutting edge of interviewing some of the top stories in the world at the time. And Jeffrey Dahmer is sitting by his dad, Lionel Dahmer, who who was a member of the Lord's Church and had Jeffrey in and out of the Lord's Church, but he had been going through a hard time, and during Jeffrey's formative years, they were not attending church regularly at all. And so Stone Phillips looks at Jeffrey Dahmer and says to him, why did you think you could do this to people? It's a great question. He then says, I always believed the lie of evolution. And I thought that I was just a blob of living stuff. And what one blob of stuff does to another blob of stuff doesn't matter. You know, if you teach kids they arose from animals, then what will they act like? animal. Stone Phillips then looks at him and says, when did you change your mind? He looks over at his dad and he says, dad, when you sent me that creation science material, I realized I was wrong and that there is a God and that I had done things that were terrible. Now, what's exciting to me is when I went to Apologetics Press, I saw a manuscript from Lionel Dahmer and several of the resources that were given to Jeffrey Dahmer were our Apologetics Press resources. Here's what's more exciting. If you teach a person that they are not the product of random chance processes over multiplied millions of years, but they are specially designed individually by a creator who loves them and put them here on purpose for a reason and that they can literally change the course of eternity with their actions because they're made in the image and likeness of God. Do you think that changes how a person thinks and lives? You better believe it does. The follow-up story to Jeffrey Dahmer is that there was a lady who was sending courses into the prison where he was, and he was taking the Bible courses, World Bible School, as I remember correctly. And he took all those Bible courses and went through them and realized he wanted to become a Christian. And so he called for one of the preachers that had access to the prison system there. This preacher went in, started studying with him, said, do you understand who Jesus is? He said, absolutely. Do you understand what Jesus can do for you? Jeffrey Dahmer said, yes. Are you willing to repent of your sins and be buried in water baptism for the forgiveness of those sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Jeffrey Dahmer said, yes, that's what I want more than anything. And Jeffrey Dahmer was baptized into Christ after having come to a belief that there's a God who created him for a purpose and he had done horrible, terrible things and he needed forgiveness for those things. You know, when Paul wrote that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 
the thrilling thing about teaching creation is not that you're refuting stuff in textbooks that teach wrongly. That's got to be done. But it's that you are infusing people with their original purpose. And their original purpose is to reflect the, the image and likeness of their amazing and wonderful intelligent designer who spoke the first two humans into existence at the beginning of creation and said be fruitful and multiply after your own kind and humans have been doing that since the beginning of creation and so the question to you this night is have you been reflecting the glory of your creator or have you been more on the side of acting like you got here by accident? Is there anything you need to do tonight to get right with the designer and the creator of your body and the being who put your immortal soul in that body and put you here for a reason? Do you need to respond to the Lord's invitation? If you do need to respond to the Lord's invitation, your Creator's invitation, don't let another night go by before you get that done.